from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos. On behalf of the Library of Congress Hispanic Cultural Society and the Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance, welcome to the Library of Congress. Those of you who have uh, traveled through the rain to be here with us today, thank you. We hope you enjoy uh, our program today. Uh, this is demonstrative of many of the cultural awareness programs that the Library of Congress offers throughout the year almost every day of the year. So we encourage you to be abreast of our calendar of events and join us as often as you can for our events. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Vice President of the Hispanic Cultural Society, Maria Perez Morales. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As, uh, as uh, Roberto uh, mentioned, uh, my name is Maria Perez Morales, and I'm the current Vice President of the Hispanic Cultural Society. Also, I'm a Senior Information Specialist in the U.S. Copyright Office. I understand there are a number of Pedro Pan folks here today. Can you raise your hand, please? Oh, wow, that's a large number. Thank you so much. Thank you, we're so delighted to have you all here with us in the Library of Congress. Welcome you all. This presentation is to offer you an individual perspective of the historical and cultural impact of this exodus. This is a very significant episode that not only impacted the US and Cuban relations, but also a broader impact on all Hispanics, both U.S. and abroad. Also, the Operation Pedro Pan was a significant part of Cuban and U.S. immigration history with powerful and far-reaching implications that still impact the Cuban and Latin America community today. This topic touches me personally because the political context in Cuba since the 1960s resembles the current political situation in Venezuela, my hometown. It seems it was only yesterday when Eloisa contacted my office, the public information office, uh, with questions regarding copyright registration back in, in 2011, sorry. She graciously invited me to attend to the roundtable conversations she was going to have, along with uh, other Pedro Pan individuals, in the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. Thank you. Since then, we have a regular lunch date during her annual visits to Washington, D.C. So it was always my sincere desire to have Eloisa and her fellow Pedopan friends here in the library to illustrate to us LOC employees with their vibrant testimony regarding this historical event. Even though this was a very sad event, she enjoys sharing this experience and will continue to do so to make sure it's documented and to make better known the history of this exodus. Now, please allow me to introduce our distinguished Pedro Pan guests. Eloisa Echazabal, since 2006, she is the assistant to campus president at Miami-Dade College Medical Campus with a student population of 59% Hispanic. Jesus J. M. Castaño, he is a recent retiree and former deputy director at the Carlos Rosario International Public Charter School, serving the immigrant community in the DC area. 
Susana Gomez. She is a retired civil rights lobbyist and has an impressive background in civil and human rights. Rene Costales, last but not least, currently is a contract interpreter and international visitor liaison for the US Department of State. For those who want to review a more detailed analysis of our panelists' accomplishments, please refer to the printed program at your own leisure. We are honored to have the opportunity to hear firsthand from a panel of these former Pedro Pan children, who will, in approximately five minutes, resume their experience, testimonials, and how this event has particularly impacted the lives of Hispanics living in the U.S. today. So please help me to welcome Elisa Echazabal. Eloisa. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Hispanic Cultural Society of the Li Library of Congress for inviting us to be here today to tell you about our Pedro Pan uh, exodus. When creating the short video that you're about to see, I decided that in order to understand better why the children and young adults were sent alone to the United States, it was very important to know the environment that Cuba had at the time. So I went and I explained that. And then after that, I went to talk about the Pedro Pan Exodus. So um, I hope that you find this very informative. This presentation first gives a quick overview of how Cuba was prior to the revolution, and then of the events that followed which led to the Pedro Pan Exodus. Before 1959, Cuba was among the most developed countries in Latin America and, in some areas, among the most developed in the world. Prior to 1959, Cuba had the highest number of physicians and dentists per capita in Latin America. It also had the highest budget for education and was among the most literate countries in Latin America. And before 1959, real wages in Cuba were the highest in Latin America. But things were not perfect. The president of Cuba at the time had become president through a political coup, which led to years of polit political corruption and instability. That is one of the reasons why Fidel Castro took power on January 1st, 1959. He was the leader of one of the movements trying to overthrow the Batista government in power at that time. Soon after that, human rights violations were the standard. Incarcerations and executions took place without due process. All independent news media was taken over by the government. Committees for the defense of the revolution were established on each block by the government. These committees reported on neighbors' anti-revolutionary feelings and activities, which resulted in harassment and many times in jail. Citizens lived in an environment of fear and persecution all the time. Other human rights violations included businesses and all rental property were confiscated without compensation to the owners. Currency was changed and people were allowed to keep only a certain amount of their own money. The government kept the rest. All private and religious schools were closed and Marxist indoctrination began in all schools throughout the island. Also, all public religious events were banned. Paramilitary groups were established by the government throughout the island and some youths were taught to use firearms supposedly to defend the country from enemy aggression. 
The previous events and others were sure signs of the type of authoritarian and totalitarian government that was taking hold of the island. Reasons why parents began to look for ways to get the children out of Cuba. And that is when Operation Pedro Pan was born. James Baker was the director of Ruston Academy in Havana, and Father Brian Walsh was the director of the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami. They assisted parents in Cuba who wished to send their children unaccompanied to the United States. They facilitated the visas and the places where the children could stay in the United States. Additionally, there was, was a large group of courageous people who distributed the visas and other travel documents throughout the island, risking their lives in the process. Among them, Penny Powers, Ramon Grau, Polita Grau, Pancho and Berta Finlay, Dr. Sergio and Serafina Higuel, Sara del Toro de Odio, and Albertina O'Farril. On December 26, 1960, the first Pedro Pan children traveled alone to the United States. Children with family or friends in the United States stayed with their family or friends. Children who had no one in the United States were placed in group homes and other facilities supervised by the Catholic Welfare Bureau. But on January 3, 1961, United States-Cuba diplomatic relations were severed, so no more visas could be issued, so no more children could leave Cuba for the United States. It appeared that Operation Pedro Pan would be coming to an end. Two solutions were created for that problem. First, the British Embassy in Jamaica began issuing visas for the children to travel to Jamaica, and then in Jamaica, they were given visas to travel to the United States. And second, the United States State Department began issuing visa waivers to the children so they could travel to the United States without a visa. Then the children began arriving in Miami again. When the Bay of Pigs invasion failed in April 1961, parents realized that the Castro government was there to stay. That's when Operation Pedro Pan went into overdrive. Here are photos of three of the various shelters where the children stayed in Miami. This is St. Raphael's Hall Group Home. This is Kendall Camp. This is where my sister and I stayed. and Matecumbe Camp. At a point, the shelters in Miami became overcrowded, so children began to be transferred to licensed care facilities like foster homes and orphanages in over 100 cities in over 35 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. For example, David City, Nebraska, and Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is the orphanage in Buffalo, New York, where my sister and I lived. And here you see also children in Colfax, Washington. During the October 1962 missile crisis, all flights between Cuba and the United States stopped. That is when Operation Pedro Pan officially ended. Some children still trickled in through, the, through third countries, but that was really the end of the exodus. By October 22, 1962, 14,048 children had left Cuba for the United States without their parents. Of those, 6,486 received foster care on their arrival or shortly thereafter. The rest stayed with relatives or friends. About three years later, in December 1965, the United States and the Cuban governments reached an agreement to develop the Freedom Flights program. The Freedom Flights lasted eight years 
and most parents were able to come to the United States this way and reunite with their children. Who were the Pedro Pan children? Most of the children were from middle class families between 6 and 16 years old, and most were teenage boys. Most were Catholic, and there were also Protestant and Jewish children in the group. Funding for the care of the children with no family or friends in the United States was provided by the federal government through various government and non-government agencies. Why the name Pedro Pan? The Miami News Media coined the term as an analogy of the Disney character Peter Pan, the boy who flew to Never Never Land. The real heroes of this exodus were the parents, because they were the ones who had to make the heart-wrenching decision of separating from their children in order to free them from the repression and communist indoctrination that was taking over the island. And today, Pedro Pans are like brothers and sisters. We get together to reminisce, to help other children in need, to document our history, and to make new friends. This is a list of some of the sources used for this presentation. And thank you for your interest in our Pedro Pan Exodus story. Okay, I had a very normal, happy childhood in Cuba. I attended parochial Catholic school all throughout since kindergarten until I left. I took ballet lessons, I took music lessons, I, this is a, a, a photo of the school that I attended. You know, at the end of the year, they have an event where they give you prizes and all that. That's it. This is um, a summer, summer camp that I attended the year before we left Cuba. And this is my passport photo. I was, uh, that was in 1959, because in 1959, my family and I came to visit the United States. But we, okay. So um, one day, you know, I think my parents made the decision to send us to the United States alone when the government took over our school. We were in school that day, my sister and I, and we saw when the militiamen came in and took over the school uh, like if they owned it. We went home, we were nervous and upset, and we told our parents what had happened and that we were not going to back to school. So we didn't go back to school anymore. Um, so for uh, weeks, you know, we were at home, we were taking English lessons with a lady, I was taking typing lessons, but we were not going to school. So our parents decided to then send us to the United States because the government had already started teaching communism in all the public schools. So, so there was really no school that we could attend. So on September 6, on September 6, 1961, my three younger cousins, my younger sister and I took a Pan American flight to the United States. I was only given two instructions. One, of course, to take care of my sister, my little sister, and my three younger cousins. And the other one was when I arrived in the United States to ask for a man named George. Oh, can you hear me? I'm not in the microphone. Was that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so George was there waiting for us. He helped us through the immigration process. And then he took us in a little van to a, um, to a camp in the Kendall area of Miami. Uh, it was a, like a typical summer camp. You know, during the daytime, there were activities, going to classes, but at night was the big difference. At night, you could tell it was not a summer camp because the children cried, especially the younger children. You could hear them all the time crying at night. We were in the camp seven days. After seven days, we were told that we would be taken to Buffalo, New York. So we went to Buffalo, New York, and we, uh, you know, we were taken to a, an orphanage. It was the Immaculate Heart of Mary Home. And if you ever saw the movie Doubt, you can have a picture of how that uh, orphanage was. You know, the dark hallways and the, flo the wooden floors that squeaked when you walked on them, very unlike tropical Cuba. Uh, it was difficult 
to uh, be in the orphanage because I couldn't relate to the other children there because most of them had never had a family before or a stable family. So it was difficult to relate to them. Also, um, the lack of privacy and uh, the lack of control that you had in your life. For example, lack of, I didn't like having my underwear being washed with all the other girls' underwear. I wasn't used to do that. So that was really uh, different. And uh, my letters from my parents were opened before they came to me. And even as a 13-year-old, I felt my space was being invaded. These days, I can sort of understand why that was done, but at the time, I didn't understand it. Um, so uh, I, I walked to, uh, to uh, elementary school with another girl in uh, a few blocks away, and that was my first introduction to the New England uh, scenery. The brown brick buildings, the mature uh, uh, tall trees, and I just thought that was really very nice, very enchanting, very unlike Cuba, but it was really very nice. So after uh, being in the orphanage two months, we were told that we would be taken to to uh, an orphanage, and um, uh, we went to the orphanage. No, excuse me, to a foster home. After being two months in the orphanage, we were taken to a foster home. It was, it was a nice family, very decent, very proper. It was the married couple with one uh, daughter younger than I, but I didn't feel warm and fuzzy. The daughter, uh, you know, resented my being there. I was getting better grades in school than her. Uh, there was competition for friends. Uh, if she couldn't go bowling the, the night that we went bowling, she didn't want us to go bowling either, so I really wasn't, and the lady, didn't like my sister and I speaking Spanish, you know, between ourselves, even in, in our own bedroom. She didn't like us to do that. So I think that was very insensitive uh, at the time. I felt that way. So after being there uh, nine, after being in the foster home seven months, we were told that we would be reuniting with our parents in, in Miami, and we did. We came to Miami finally, and that was the, I gotta go, that was the, okay, that was the, um, the beginning of the second chapter of our Cuban exile life in the United States, with all the difficulties, trials, and tribulations of exile life in those days. Fast forward, my first full-time job after I graduated from high school was as a, a bilingual secretary for Manolo Reyes. Manolo Reyes was, as far as I know, the uh, uh, that was at WTVJ Channel 4. As far as I know, he was the first Spanish-speaking newscaster in the United States. And one of my jobs every day was to translate his daily editorial from Spanish into English so the, the news director of the station would know what he was saying in Spanish. Um, so th that's it. Um, and uh, the rest of my background and my story, it's in the programs that you all have. Thank you very much. And now I would like to call Jay Castaño so he can tell us about his story. Good morning again, and thanks to uh, the Library of Congress and the Hispanic Cultural Society and all of you for coming in, especially some of my uh, co-workers are, are here, and it is a pleasure that you could make it. Uh, I came in April of 1962. Um, I did not want to come to the United States. I had told my family that I wanted to work uh, with one of the teachers who was uh, our neighbor, and uh, I adored her. Uh, and she said, listen, I am going to be the chief of the Comité de Defensa de la Revolución. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> That's me, <laughs> about 100 pounds lighter. <laughs> uh, so I said, what do you have to do with a committee for the defense of the revolution? And she said, oh, all you have to do is make sure that you talk with the kids in the school and you find out if their parents agree with the revolution. And if you also, if you hear something in your home about uh, Fidel Castro that is not in favor of the revolution, then you let me know. I said, that's fine. And she said, perhaps when you grow up, uh, and you graduate from high school, we can make sure that you get a scholarship to go to Russia. 
And I liked that idea. So one day at dinner, I told my folks and I said, uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Fernandez is telling me that I could belong to the Committee for the Revolution, uh, for the Defense of the Revolution. And uh, my folks looked at each other and said, but you're only 12 or 11, actually. And I said, well, this is what she said. You know, I don't have to do anything. I just have to talk with my classmates and then inform her. Well, that was enough for my parents and my brother uh, to say two or three days later, they said, well, you know what? We are going to leave Cuba. We're going to go to the United States soon. And if you want to stay behind, that's fine. So I started thinking about it. And uh, sure enough, I said, no, I want to be with all of you. I'm ready to go. But when I arrived in Miami, I wasn't 100% sure that I had done the right thing because I kept thinking about uh, the revolution and I really liked Fidel and so did my family. At any rate, I went back to Cuba 25 years later instead of 25 days later. You know, in the visa waiver, it said to return 25 days after departure. Well, I waited 25 years. And then I went back again a second time in 1993. And the last time was in the year 2000. And I still have family there. Uh, I respect all of them. Some of them are gusanos. That's what we were called, worms. And I'm very proud to be a worm. And the first time I went back to Cuba in uh, 1987, uh, they called me compañero. And they took a few things out of my luggage. They said, "Why you're going to be in Cuba for two weeks. Why do you need four or five uh, pieces of underwear? And, and uh, why are you bringing two watches and this and the other? So they confiscated a few things. I left all my underwear with one of my cousins because his wife whispered in my ear, uh, he only has two calzoncillos. Could you share some of yours? I said, sure. Um, and, and I also found out during that first visit that a lot of people there were saying, hay que tener fe. And I heard that several times. And I said to my family in Santa Fe near Havana, I said, fe, that means that you're all very religious. They said, no, that means fe is familia en el extranjero. <laughs> because the Cubans in Miami, even though we were called the mafia, kept uh, bringing medicine and clothing and sending dollars. And the second time I went, I, were, I was not called compañero. I was called Señor Castaño. I said, wow, things have really changed. And then in the year 2000, when I went, I went through Jamaica. I didn't go from Miami. And I entered uh, Terminal 3. That was the international uh, terminal. And they spoke to me in English. And they said, welcome to Cuba, a member of the Cuban community. So uh, the question is, am I going back to Cuba? Yes. I always heard Cuba see, si, Yankees no. And now it is Cuba see, si, Yankees see. Si. And I'm going both as a Cuban, a proud Cuban, and a proud American. Susana, is, Susana will be coming up now to tell us about her experience. Susana Gomez. Yeah, I don't look like Jay. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like it. Yeah, I'm um, on your program, on your leaflet. I'm on the fifth row, um, and on the fifth row from the bottom up, and the third one from the left to the right. My granddaughter says, Grandma's got puffy hair. That much hasn't changed, but thank you, Maria, for having us here, and thank you to the Library of Congress, and for all of you to be here with us. 
um, for us to share our story with you. We all, Pedro Bonds, 14,078 of us, have our own stories. The stories differ. They are hard stories. They're wrenching. I mean, think of a child being wrenched from their house, from the bosom of their family, putting them on a plane, and off you go to never, never land. And that's the way it, ha it was. Uh, most of us are survivors in the good sense. Most of us survived and have done excellently in the United States with the welcome of the American people and the U.S. government. A few did not do so well, but for the most part, we've done very well. And we're very grateful to our parents and to the United States of America for that. 1961, some of you in the audience were not even born. So let me put a little context into that. Uh, so you can transfer yourself to 1961 and the fear that existed in the United States Congress and in the American people about having a communist government 90 miles away from our shores. The Bolsheviks took over in Russia in 1917 and very soon after that declare their status of government of appropriating all private property and millions of people were starving to death because they appropriated private personal no matter what the size of the, uh, of the property was. This, by 1922, they started annexing other countries, other areas close to the Russia, and they kept on advancing and advancing. In 1961, you may remember the, Nart the uh, Berlin Wall went up, and they tried to sort of what they did to conquer the people, to just keep them from receiving food and supplies and materials. And the allies, the United States included, flew for years, you know, supplies and food to the people. The wall finally came down in 1990, and Berlin today is nothing like it was in 61. I went in 72, and I just went back in 2012. It's an exciting city full of energy, and I hope that Cuba will be like that again. Cuba was not, as Eloisa showed so well in her video, was not a third world country, like some people make, make, it, make believe that it was. And uh, Fidel Castro succeeded in making it like a third world country. So you will find that most of us are very proud of our heritage, and we're very proud, like Jay, to be American citizens. So we are Cuban, and we are American to the hilt. And many Cuban Americans have also served in the armed forces. Um, so I could go on and on, so I'm gonna go back to what I'm supposed to do now. And that's to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I had a wonderful childhood. I was very sheltered, uh, in a sense. Uh, my parents had been very poor, and by the time I was born, uh, we were middle class. And I grew up in a gated community. I went to a private girls' Catholic school since I was three years old, from kindergarten like Eloisa, till I left, just about. Um, so it was, it was wonderful. I just played in the streets. You couldn't get into trouble because somebody would tell my mother. Or we had a policeman in a bicycle that went around, and boy, they always found out. So we were very, very safe and unaware of what was going on around us. And then the revolution came, and things changed. And there's a lot of talk, and there's tanks out on the street. And in my house, nobody ever talked politics. Uh, none of that went on that the children could hear. And then my friends started talking about leaving. And uh, I, I had wanted to know what was going on, so dad took me to some demonstration or parade without saying a thing. And I, I said to say to him, well, this, this isn't liberty. You know, people just taking your place, pushing you aside, just innocent things that a child would notice. And he said, and then he later on says, no, it's, it's not liberty, it's libertinaje. It's, um, I don't know how to translate that. Maybe Grené will help me with that word later. Um, so anyway, I went back to school and my friends are looking at the map and saying that they're leaving for the United States and where they wanna go. And 
they asked me, where do you want to go? And I said, Washington, D.C. And they said, why? and I, they asked me why. I said, it's the capital of the United States, for crying out loud. Where else would I want to go? And then um, I was in the second year of baccalaureate, and um, our class had been joined. Most of the class had been together since we were three. And that year, the class was joined by uh, Captain Ayala's daughter. Captain Ayala is the captain that had tortured Armando Valladares, who became ambassador um, after he was released from Cuban prison, U.S. ambassador, I can't remember for what, um, but very, very important man today. And I, I just got tired of it. And I, I was taught very young age to stand up for what I believed, which has gotten me into a lot of trouble. Uh, but I just like had enough of her. I had been very docile in school. And I just grabbed her by the white blouse and said, you just keep it up and I'm gonna beat the hell out of you. That's exactly what I said. Well, the nun called my parents and my parents came to the school and I never went back. The next day, I was at Columbus Academy, a former American school. Conversations there were pretty much the same, and so it didn't take me long to get into trouble again. Uh, the history class, all our courses, when you were in baccalaureate in Cuba, uh, whether you went to private school or not, you had to be examined in each subject in, in the baccalaureate program by the regional Department of Education, uh, it was the Instituto de Vedado. If you failed that course, you had to take it again, and again, and again, or you just, and I think if you failed two courses, and maybe Rene Anje can enlighten us on how many, you couldn't pass the grade. Even if you went to a private school, and they could change your grade. That didn't, didn't matter. That's the way it was before the revolution, and, af and initially after the revolution. And um, so in the history class, we had this red hair teacher. She ended up being the aunt to a friend of mine. And she was indoctrinating us and teaching us stuff that we were not gonna be tested on. And I just like stood up and I said, do you mind teaching us what we're gonna be tested on? I mean, this is not fair. We're gonna fail if you keep it up. Something to that effect. And then my parents were paying for us to get a good education, and that was not part of the course. Well, the next day, the entire school was plastered with propaganda against Castro, and everybody looked at me. What did you do? And I said, I went home. I had no idea. I can't even walk here. I live too far away. So Dad was taking me to school and picking me up from school, and he just trying to keep up with how much trouble I was getting into because I had to just, I had this quixotic feeling I mean, he had taught me to stand up for what I believe, but I didn't, I, I was not street smart. I just, I was being very stupid and, and young and naive. And um, so I told him what happened. And the next day, uh, he took me to school and mid-morning, the principal of the school came. That's when they were trying to identify who had put the propaganda. He says, uh, your father's downstairs, you have a doctor's appointment. Looked to my right, I looked to my left of my friends, my new friends in that school, and I said, I have a doctor's appointment. This is goodbye. And um, so he told me on the way home, uh, you're leaving the United States this afternoon. Your mom's packing your bags. You and Joe are leaving. Jim Baker's picking you up. And I was like speechless. So we went home and we left as a family for the airport and there were like, five dollars in each of my brother's shoes and our suitcase and that was that. And then when we got to Rancho Olleros to the airport, we went to the cafeteria to eat and I was with my family and I started bad-mouthing the government again. And my, my oldest brother was of military age and he was beside himself, esta chiquita es estupida, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so dad, with a, my f eating, finishing eating, um, took me away, aside and we went to the fishbowl, to La Pecera. And uh, in La Pecera, that's only where people who are actually boarding the plane are supposed to be. Don't ask me how, but my mother and my father went in there. 
And then they called us to search our suitcases and they called you individually. So dad again went with me. And the only, like Juan Valdez thought he was bringing his train, my only treasure coming with me was a Greek mythology book in English. And the soldiers decided to take it away. Well, I blew up and it was not good. And fortunately, my dad was there and he saved me one more time. And this time I got so scared, I didn't utter another word. And we went back to the fishbowl and um, then we finally boarded the plane, Joe and I, and I can still remember his blue eyes, just mischievous and with his freckles. And then he started bad mouthing the government. I had no idea he knew anything of what was going on. I said, shut up. We haven't taken off yet. And so when we got to Miami, um, it was very late. The flight had been very delayed and Miami airport was not what it is today. And the exit was very dark, it seemed to me. It was very dim light and there was nobody else. So we were holding on to each other with, for dear life. And um, all of a sudden we saw this man coming towards off us we couldn't see his face but when I finally realized Jim Baker uh, was the man I was just such a sign of relief and comfort and said it's gonna be okay and then he took us to Kendall camp and there we were met by Mr. and Mrs. Pruna and the nuns and um, they separated us immediately and um, that was the end of that part of the story and I think I'm out of time so I won't say anything more but we all have uh, our stories, they're painful, they stay with us. Um, and Ana Gardano uh, mentioned the other day, she's a Pedro Pan, she's a psychologist, she just make, made a presentation on, on the PTSD of Pedro Pans at the United Nations last week, I think it was. And it is real, it does come back to you. We just shut off all feelings until we survive. And then when you get older and things slow down, it comes back to haunt you until you reconcile with those feelings. But I'm eternally grateful for my parents to have, to have had the courage to bring us to the United States. Thank you very much. I think it's my turn, so yes. I thank you for <laughs> the invitation. Push the button, push the button. okay. Uh, Thank you for the invitation, and I want to reinforce uh, what my colleague said. It's usually for the, for the Peter Pan boys, it's always harder to talk about the emotions. So let me talk a little bit about the numbers and highlight a few of the numbers so you focus well what we were saying. 85% were boys. 85% were between the ages of 12 and 16. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that cohort. I was 15 at the time when the schools were confiscated. They put another number in, in, in fact. The cohort of students in Havana about that time were of the order of 100,000. I don't have the right number, but we're talking about 100,000 students. Only 20 to 25%, I don't have the right number, actually went to public schools. Public schools did not have the capacity. So 75% of the students one night, one day, one morning, had no school to go to. So that was a big problem, okay? So what was happening? The schools were, a, were the conflict, political conflict of the polarization of, of society was happening at the time and was most uh, sensitive. You heard some of the stories, my school too, and we had marches and you know, many other events. You know. But what happens is then you have a cohort of friends. So I had about 20 male friends about my same age. The political spectrum went from two extreme cases. One case, Pibe left in a sailboat with a cousin because he had an uncle in Miami because he couldn't stand his parents who had become communists. On the other end, Jose wanted to be a young pioneer, a young rebel, a young communist, and his parents could not stand him, signed his emancipation papers, and his parents left, okay? So that's my cohort of friends, okay? That full spectrum. So that gives you an idea of what's happening. Luckily, for that year, I had no school. I was a chess player, so I played chess 24-7. That's why you see me winning the Vermont State Championship 
opened in 1963, uh, and there. You can see then uh, the, the group home that I was with. I was sent with five other Cuban boys to Don Bosco home in uh, Burlington, Vermont, and that was the day some of us went, left in the airport with some of the other students. As you can see in the picture, you know, you can see my multiracial background, so that's another thing that you might not see in some of the other pictures. Uh, We've said it, most of us were middle class. Why? Because Cuba was relatively well developed as a Latin American country and had an extensive middle class, okay? So the fight for the, the fight at that time for the hearts and souls of the young students in this cohort was particularly intense, okay? Not only 14 left unaccompanied, many left accompanied, okay? And many also received scholarships to former Soviet countries, maybe 15,000, I don't have the right number, but approximately in that same range of ballpark numbers. So that gives you an idea of what happened very suddenly. Of course, these were the young boys who would become cannon fodder for, in the opposition. The, at that time, the regime was putting maybe up to 100,000 people in jail for political purposes. There were, the number of political prisoners did reach a number like 100,000, and there were many people who were shot there. Remember, he, Castro started shooting the uh, former henchmen of the Batista regime, and he kept on shooting anybody who opposed him. Okay? So the, the terror system was being established at the point in time. And that's what we left. Um, luckily, I was able to, to finish high school in one year. Uh, I was able to come to Washington and study at Catholic U. Um, I had a 30-year career in the Inter-American Development Bank, helping many Latin American countries. I have not been able to help my country yet. But someday, when it's free and the conditions are uh, there, I'll be happy to also work on that. And. Uh, uh, one of the, the, we were invited, it was mentioned, and you can see that as a common theme in many of our curriculum vitae, we do many things that help the community at large in the United States as being full citizens of the United States, we participate, but we also happen to help many of the community, and many of the community that we help are the Latin American community, I happen to work as a court interpreter court certifying interpreter, and most of the time, even this morning, I did one hearing case. Uh, and uh, we're no longer the largest exodus, like this, this slide says. The last year, maybe 60,000 Central American unaccompanied minors came to the United States. Recorded. They recorded. They Okay, uh, and luckily, uh, because of the interest of this, of this uh, invitation today, we also were able to get an invitation to go and talk this afternoon to the staff of the Office of Refugee Resettlement of the Department of Health and Human Services, because they're very interested on, on our PTSD as uh, adolescents in the United States. Uh, how did we manage to get over? Well, we had many experiences. I was a little older, so I learned faster English because I had a girlfriend in, as a sophomore, one junior, one senior would practice with uh, each of the girlfriends every night on the phone, and I learned English really fast. So yes, it, it's been a great experience working, living in the United States, but we all hope for a free Cuba. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have any microphone, but um, you can raise your hands right. and Thank you. stand up. Um, Thank my you. My name is Guillermo Bell. I was born here in 1963, so I'm not part of Operation Peter Pan. But um, like everybody, you know, I have many, many relatives that came to my UK. And thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I grew up listening to stories from my older cousins, my second cousins, and my third cousin, which match very closely your stories. Nearly all of them had positive experiences, but there were a couple that did not have positive um, I wanted to address actually what Renee just brought up and actually uh, what you responded to, which is this question of the last year immigration crisis where probably over 60,000 people crossed the Mexican border. Um, there are Latin American children just like you were. Uh, to them, there is no difference between what is legal and what is illegal, how they got here, it's all the same. 
I'm confident that all your parents would have sent you here, even if sending you here was against the law. I'm sure, that, as I'm sure that all my aunts and uncles and great aunts and uncles would have done the same. So I'm just asking you guys to comment, if you want, on what happened last summer, what is continuing to happen, and what connection you might see between your experiences and their experiences. Thank you. But I'll tell you one thing. I compare ourselves to the dreamers. Because even though we came legally and they did not come legally, those children and young people have uh, grown up in this, in this country. They have, have adapted to this country. They have learned English. They have been attending school. They have tried to do their best. And now, all of a sudden, unlike us, they find that you know it's very difficult to go on to the university because in most states they have to you know pay uh, out of state tu tuition and all that. So I, but I compare ourselves to them because you know they came young, they came with their parents. Most of them, the young ones, not uh, you know came you know nobody asked them if they wanted to come or not. So I compare ourselves to those. I have a comment here. Because I worked with the immigrant community of Washington, D.C., uh, the adult uh, community for the last 37 years at the Carlos Rosario, uh, some of the uh, kids that came in from Guatemala and El Salvador and so forth, and Mexico, many of them, uh, have ended up here in Washington, D.C., and they have come to our school to learn English or GED. And uh, they're very lucky because in addition to learning the language, we also have a division of supportive services where we try to find housing for them. And if they are ready to work, because they are considered emancipated adults once they are 16 years of age, then we also try to place them doing some work, you know, the restaurants, the uh, hospitality industry in D.C. And uh, the founder of the school, Mrs. Sonia Gutierrez, has been very involved with the National Council of La Raza. I was there at the convention in L.A. and this issue was addressed in many of the workshops. And, and so we have served as a uh, lighthouse for many of these kids, and also the Casa de Maryland, and a few places in Virginia. It seems like Virginia has never been too friendly to uh, those people, but uh, luckily, Maryland and D.C. are lenient. We do not ask for any papers whatsoever. They just have to prove that they live in D.C. and that they need to, to learn the language. Um, let me draw a parallel comparison to try to answer your question. There's always a supply and demand issue. Just like us, Pedro Pans in Cuba, uh, we were, many of us sent by our parents, others like me, I decided my parents approved uh, because we were different ages and more cognizant of the situation and different things. Uh, to Emilio Cueto in the prior panel said that we were constructively evicted from Cuba because <laughs> of many reasons. I mentioned that uh, we would have become the cannon fodder for the opposition. We probably would have been shot and gone to jail as we do. We have been educated in freedom. We could not take, you know, straight indoctrination to become slaves. So in the parallel with Central America has to do with the gangs. Uh, all the children who left, basically, many are fleeing the gangs or many are saying that they're fleeing the gangs to come to the United States. Either, either way, the gangs no longer have easy recruits like they had in the previous year. So that might change the situation in terms of gang control in Central America. We would hope that the, that would be at least one possible benefit of that exodus. I would like to say that I agree with Eloisa and, I mean, I agree with everybody on the panel, uh, but I consider Pedro Pons to be the first dreamers, a phrase that was coined by David Montgomery. Um, we were the first dreamers. We also had a lot of hardships in trying to pay for our education, and our families had to work, you know, different jobs, and um, people who were lawyers and doctors and whatever, everybody did whatever they had to do, whether it was janitorial or whatever it was. 
uh, to make a decent living and provide for a very humble uh, lifestyle. Um, and, and we all made it, for the most part. Insofar as the children coming from Central America, it is very, very sad. It is very sad, and I understand that we need to be, how would you say it, conscious of the needs of these children who are not to blame, but shame on the sending countries for crying out loud. Let's put the fault where it is. Enough is enough. And I think the United States needs to put pressure on those sending countries to have better socioeconomic development for their people. It is right for the United States people to honor the Statue of Liberty and receive people from abroad and to help them and give them the liberty to have a productive life and to be good citizenships in the United States. But don't abuse the children. Give them a right in your own country to live. And that's my position. And yes, I'm angry. Here you go, my quixotic self. I'm coming through and just expressing myself. So I'm. S <laughs> Never mind. Go <laughs> ahead, Maria. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, any further questions? I was at Kendall and then Opalaka. I stayed in the refugee camp for two years. Uh, at that time, my mom was already 55 years old, and one of my uncles was about 50. And uh, they asked each child, who do you have in Cuba that you would like to come here? My dad had already left, died, and my brother and his wife lived in Pittsburgh. They were freezing. <laughs> up there, but uh, they got a job through the Presbyterian Church, thank God. And um, I, I said, well, I want to see them again. I miss them. And about six months later, there was a ship uh, of the Red Cross, American Red Cross, that went to Cuba. Uh, and it was the first of about 10 ships that went to Cuba and picked up many of the parents and relatives of the Pedro Pan kids. So I was reunited with them about two years later in Miami. My mother and my sister came with visa waivers eight months later. Uh, we were in New Jersey at the time, and so they reunited with us there. Mom went to work at a factory sewing garments. Some other Cuban ladies taught her how to use the machine. My sister um, was key punching in, in some other place in an office. And uh, dad came in 1965 um, in the Freedom Flights, not the first one, but soon thereafter. And my oldest brother, we did not reunite with him until 1982. Uh, the statistic is that uh, happily 98% of the Pedro Pans uh, were re reunited with their parents. There's a 2% that were not. And many of the 2% is because their parents were shot by the Cuban Revolution. In my case, uh, about four years later, when the freedom rights started again, the Pan children were given priority and my parents were able to come uh, to see me graduate from college. Well, when I reunited with our parents at the airport in Miami, my sister and I, I keep saying that there were two words that kept, you know, during the conversations at the airport and on the way home, there were two words that keep hitting me like this is exile and the two words were la factoria because my mother had to start working in a factory and um el laundry which is the laundromat because we were not used to taking our clothes to the laundromat so uh it was you know it was different definitely a second chapter that we had to deal with and but you know here we all are 
And I must say about education, I am very proud to say that it took me 10 years to get my associate degree because I was working shifts at Eastern Airlines, but I persevered and I got my associate degree. When I went to my boss to show him the certificate, he says, okay, now I want to see the next one. <laughs> so I said, oh my God. And I finally did it. You know, I got a master's talking, later on. So. Talking about education back, I think it was in the 18th century, there was an elite of Creoles in Cuba, a very well-educated um, um, community of Creoles, and it, it's just, it transferred from the 18th century, 18th, 19th century, whenever it was, I was looking for my notes to find the exact date, and uh, it's, it's um, the parents, the Cuban parents, for the most part, have instilled in their children the value of education, uh, the value of the family. And, but education is just foremost. So no matter how poor you were, you were supposed to study hard and learn as much as you can. So I think that pride continues to go through our generations and you find that a good percentage of uh, Cuban Americans, second generation, have gone to college. I think it's 43% of the, I think it's the figure of uh, the second generation have gone to, to college in the United States. So it's, it's a pretty good, number. pretty good number. Thank you, any more questions? I have a question. <laughs> sure. uh, if you have not been to Cuba, I'm asking you to please consider going this is from March of this year. Okay, Che Guevara, and it says, Viva el Capitalismo. <laughs> Go there and show the Cubans what it means to be free. Thank you. Yeah. Well, since he showed the picture of somebody I consider an assassin, I have to tell you my personal experience. Of hundreds of people I have played chess with and beat him, he was the only one who just turned around and left without saying, and you beat him? Yeah, yeah. After you beat him? <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. 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 Good for you. <laughs> One more question here. Yeah. How, how long uh, were you without your parents? Well, my case was a little different. Okay. Uh, my father was already here because um, he came about two weeks before we arrived, my sister and I arrived, because he had a visa. So he didn't want it to let it expire. So when we arrived, he came to see us at the, at the, at the uh, camp the first day. And he wanted to take us out. And there were conversations going back and forth. And it was decided that we should stay in the camp because my father didn't have a job. He was living in a little room in Little Havana. So if he took the two girls, that would have created another problem. So it was decided that we stayed. And they went ahead and they sent us to Buffalo. My mother came two months later. But still, they decided they, that we should stay in Buffalo so we could finish our school year. I was not happy about it. My sister was not happy about it. They went back and forth. We went back and forth. Okay, yes, you come. Oh, no, you won't come. Oh, yes, you come. That was really, uh, that was really uh, a traumatic experience that, uh, didn't, you know, that, that I consider as part of my Pedro Juan experience. But here we are. So in May, in May, we came back to Miami after the school year was over. Um, we both passed our school year, but I think if we had come earlier to Miami, we would have passed also. But that's just deja vu. Is that how much it is? How long before you saw your parents? Nine uh, months. Nine months. months. Two years. Oh, Two years. Two years. For me, it was eight months from my mother. It was four and a half years from my father, and then I have not counted the years from my oldest brother. And the hardest part, when you look at the whole picture, was not getting on the plane and going to Kendall. That was just like the first chapter, because after Kendall, we were supposed to go on scholarships, one to Virginia, one to Ohio, and dad said no. And so another friend um, 
the father, the parents of a friend of mine since I was three became our legal guardians and we went to friends' houses for three months to finish the school year and we were happy. I mean, we missed our parents, but we were treated like another child in those homes. And then with the Bay of Pigs and not knowing whether we would see our parents ever again and the economic hardships of Miami, because Miami was nothing like it is today. Um, we were asked to go to New Jersey to live with two uncles and they were strangers to us and that was the hardest part of exile, exile that still haunts me. And my mother didn't believe me um, until she got there and then she saw it for herself and my uncles would open my letters to my parents. And you know, my brother used to be beaten every day until I had enough one day. And I saw him come home and go underneath my uncle and his wife's bed, crying. And the next day I grabbed the phone and I called the Cuban Refugee Center and I told them what was happening. And they said, have a good talk with your uncle and if things don't change, find your way to the airport, call me from there and I'll fly you both back to my home. Um, so things got a little better but that was rough, you know, to go from a loving environment, um, you're in a place where you know nobody. And I felt very guilty because I was supposed to be protecting my brother. And, you know, it was rough for me, but it was rougher on him and it was not fair. And so, so we were very poor after that. So a ch happy chapter starts with mom and my sister and being very, very poor and picking up furniture out of the street and rolling the laundry to the laundromat and not having a hair dryer, putting your hair in rollers and going out to the street. I mean, just crazy little stuff, but it was happy time. Very poor, but very happy time. Mm -hmm. How Thank you very much. How about you? Well, four and a half years. Four and a half. Can I at least, do we still have some time? Um, it's oh, okay. So I guess it's time for oh, you to. Oh, who are the Pedro Pans here? Yeah, I, okay. I know why you asked the question, uh, Gladys, because Gladys, my friend from Miami, who came with me, um, is a Pedro Pan, and she was without seeing her parents 17 years. So that's uh, unusual, but it's something to really think about. I think you were already married and pregnant when they no. came. Oh, Mary and three kids. <laughs> yeah, we have Juan Jose Valdez in the back, who came at seven years of age by himself, not knowing English, with nobody there to pick him up. And he was looking for his train all over the airport. I found it. And you found it when you went back to Cuba. That's why I see it. And we have another Pedro Juan back there. By the way, Mr. Juan Valdez organizes the trips to Cuba, wow. so for the, National Geographic. for the National Geographic. So get in touch with him. Now we also have the Smithsonian is also organizing trips to Cuba, and Mr. Wooderman works for the Latino Center of the Smithsonian. So let's get your passports ready. <laughs> but I will not take on a tour. <laughs> <laughs> and Emilio Puerto, another Pedro Pan, is leading Smithsonian tours to Cuba as well. We're all over the place. We have different philosophies. And going to Cuba is a very healing experience for some. I'm not going back until things change some more. So, but we are all different. We have two more Pedro Pan. I, I, uh, um, my parents came uh, two and a half years after I did. But my experience was a good experience because my uncle and my aunt picked me up from the airport. And I stayed in Miami those early years. And so we had a lot of friends and a lot of kids who were like me, but so it, it wasn't the, the culture shock that you guys went through. So for that, I was grateful. My uncle and my aunt took, care of, took good care of me. I was 10 years old. There is also an organization, for those of you who do research on children being separated from their families, um, on my 60th birthday, um, 
six years ago, I participated in the conference of Kinder Transport. These were the Jewish kids that were sent by their parents to live in England to save them from Holocaust. Benito. Yes, I, I came when I was seven years old. And so it was four years later, I was 11 years old when I reunited with my parents. But I, I came uh, with my three siblings. So there was four of us, you know, there was nine, eight, seven, six. And uh, they split us up, the two girls went with one foster home and, uh, and I went in another foster home and we were there for uh, a number of years until 1965 we reunited here in, uh, at uh, the National Airport. Uh, we reunited with my parents who, who hit my father was a physician and he had to find a replacement because they didn't want the brain drain in Cuba. So my father being a physician, they needed for him to wait for someone to graduate and train them at the hospital before he could come. That's the reason why I came on a company. And then he also had to pay back his mortgage because he had, a, he had a brand new house in the suburbs and he had to turn that over to the government. So he had the title, before he could turn the title over to the, the people, the house belonged to the people, he had to pay for the mortgage on it. So he had to find a way to get all the money together to pay the mortgage and then hand over the money. And he still couldn't come on the flights, so he had to go to Mexico, and he was in Mexico for a number of months before he reunited with us in 1965. Thank you very much. Any other Pedro Pan folk? Thank you so much for your wonderful questions. Now, can I have remarks? Uh, thank you again for attending our presentation, and I hope that you found it interesting and informative. If you, would like to, if you would like additional information, I created a website with all the primary and secondary sources that I have gathered throughout the years about the Pedro Pan Exodus. The website address is www.pedropanexodus.com, and this address is included in my bio section of the program that you all uh, can pick up in the back. Thank you very much again. Thank you so very much for being here and thank you very much for sharing your stories. We appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.